Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you, Tamara, for the lovely announcements. I asked her earlier if she needed help with the Armenian names, and she was like, of course not. I lived in Glendale, so it was a really amazing job. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, thank you for the worship band, and thank you for all, everyone here. You guys love Jesus more than football, so it's amazing that you're here. Um, so I'm going to do a really long sermon. <laughs> So you, you, I'll, I'll make sure you get back in time for halftime at least. I think Usher's performing. It's not, a, it's not Taylor Swift. I'm sorry. Anyway, let's pray and then let's conclude this series that we've been doing called the Baptism of um, the Sacraments and the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about the Baptism of Water, and it rained a lot right after that sermon. <laughs> so, so hopefully when I talk about today's topic, the Baptism of the Spirit, there will be a an extra outpouring of God's spirit to change lives. So that's our, that's our desire and hope as we put our place in Jesus Christ. He alone could baptize us with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. So we've been going through the sacraments uh, for a reason is because we made this jump to do a weekly communion. Our church used to do once uh, a month. Now we do it every week. And if you want to know the rationale behind that, you could always look at our sermons online uh, on Facebook and in YouTube. And if you need help to find them, uh, stay tuned for a weekly email blast where the links will be provided for you. So with that said, let's pray and let's conclude this series on the sacraments and the spirit with the conclusion on talking about what does the phrase mean being baptized by the Holy Spirit? So with that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are with us right now. And I pray for your will to be done right now. Uh, we bind anything not of you and we ask for your presence to just be here, to guide us, to comfort us, to be with us. Help us, help these words that are about to be proclaimed. Let it be all you, less of me, and let your will be done in this moment. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so we'll be reading from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. We honor the holy scriptures here. And uh, at CFTN, we like to rise and read the scriptures together. So we'll read these seven verses from Acts 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. You may be seated. Oh, the word of the Lord. I knew I was missing something. All right, I'm going to share my testimony again. My, my three-year-old always says again whenever he does something uh, again. So the reason why I'm sharing my conversion story is because it's my main tool to evangelize. It's my story. Each of you have a story of how you encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think every Christian needs to internalize that story as a reminder of the goodness of God, but also as a tool to share with other people. Uh, and I want to kind of talk about my testimony today and my call, not to brag about myself or talk about myself, but because I want to use it as a case study to understand what it is a conversion is, what it is uh, the phrase of receiving the Holy Spirit. So for those who know and don't know, um, I will share the story of when I came to faith. Uh, the Apostle Paul, real quick, would share his testimony at least three times in the Acts, so it was a main tool he talked about to, to evangelize. And I do think as an exercise, each and every one of us who's a Christian should have a five-minute testimony, a one-minute testimony to share when the moment arises when a friend asks, why are you a Christian? So with that said, uh, I grew up in a Christian home, and... Uh, it was 10th grade in high school. I was a sophomore. My brother just went to Columbia University. My parents had to work a lot. And I was stranded uh, at my house a lot, questioning the purpose of everything. 
And it wasn't just some teenager trying to find himself. I had those deep questions. If God is real, then my feelings should feel different. The purpose behind everything should really be there if God is real. If he's not there, then a lot of this is meaningless. The, the reason why I'm waking up, going to school, that there's no meaning if God is not real. So I was actually questioning God's existence. And I was questioning the purpose of my existence in the process. So long story short, there was a season of depression, anger, confusion, and it eventually led to a point around this time uh, during the winter break of high school. And I pretty much said, God, if you're real, end this pain I'm feeling. I didn't do a sinner's prayer. I didn't have someone lead me to faith, even though I was being influenced by going to church and hearing the gospel be proclaimed. I don't want, and I had parents who prayed for me. But I got to a point where I'm like, God, if you're real, end this pain I'm feeling. So one night, I surrender. I get on my knees. I say, help. And the Holy Spirit comes into the room. And God no longer became some abstract thing I needed to prove. The Holy Spirit was there. God was real. And I knew Jesus was behind all this. And I felt saved. I felt connected. I felt different. The light bulb went on. My heart was changed. I was happy. I was crying, but I was crying tears of joy. And then I pick up the scriptures later that night, and I go turn to John chapter 5, and Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you're searching the scriptures expecting to find life, but you refuse to come to me to find it, for all the scriptures are about me. And then I started reading the Bible. I already knew the Bible, but I started reading the Bible for the first time and realizing that it's all about Jesus. It's kind of like I got the cheat code to unlock the mysteries of scripture. I saw Jesus in every page and how the New Testament was pointing back to him, the Old Testament was pointing forward to him, and I couldn't put the Bible down. I became a Bible thumper, not a thumper, a Bible reader. I still thump the Bible, I'm doing that right now. But you got the idea, I love the Bible. The Bible became a living word all of a sudden because it was connecting me and making me understand the Jesus who just saved me. That's when I believe I received the Holy Spirit and was baptized by the Holy Spirit in that moment of conversion. So what do you consider the language you tend to use? What tradition you come from? What language do you use to talk about your conversion? If you come from more of the high church like we talked about last week, You'll, you could say I was a Christian at my baptism. But we were in the evangelical, non-denominational church, and we press the importance of, no, you need to decide, do you have a relationship with God or not? A more traditional evangelical talk would be, are you born again? If you're coming from John chapter 3. Was there a moment where you were born again? I would say I was born again what, that night in my room. And that language is born of above. Jesus becomes more than just a name. That you're born of the Spirit. A more theological term you get from Paul and from the Reformation. Are you justified by faith? Did you have that moment of faith and trust in Jesus? Did you make that decision? It is by faith we are saved. That also is language for the conversion moment. Uh, or have you come to Jesus moment? That's like a like an expression people use, in, I think in the South. I'm not from the South, I don't know. But have you heard that phrase? It was my come to Jesus moment. It was the coming to, ju- to truth moment. Uh, or another way to talk about it is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? When was the moment you had a relationship with God? Through Jesus. I am under the belief, when we talk about the, when the scriptures talk about, it doesn't matter what I talk, think about, it's what, this, what I believe the scriptures are saying is when the language is used, baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's referring to the moment where your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit, where you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you surrender, you're all in, he forgives your sin, his dad becomes your dad, because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is now living with you. You have the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized by the Holy Spirit that Jesus only could give. And I say this because there's a lot of tension and division over languages of conversion. But at the end of the day, we need to be a church 
that celebrates our conversions, shares the testimony of the conversion, and encourage people to experience the grace, the love, and receive the Holy Spirit. So for me, I like to bracket three types of conversions, and I hope you're thinking about your own conversion as I'm talking. I find that there's three types of conversions, and these are just, you know, generalizations. There's the Apostle Paul, the road to Damascus moment. This is when you were like that raging atheist, and all of a sudden, in one night, you become a Christian. Uh, you have the, you see the light, literally. You see Jesus Christ show up. These are the testimonies that tend to be uh, popularized and encouraged to be shared because you have this person who may have been in this awful anti-Christian state all of a sudden be pro-Christian. Praise God for those testimonies. Maybe you had a testimony where you were someone who was so far from God and then all of a sudden you surrendered and you became a Christian and the light turned on. Praise God for that. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home, in a Christian community, or you just didn't grow up in that home, but for whatever reason, you were close with the Holy Spirit at an early age. You may have not had the language for it, but you believed in Jesus early on. And it might have been the prayers of a grandparent or an example of a parent that opened the spiritual door for you to connect with the one true God. And if you read the scriptures, it says John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb. He had two godly parents. And these are my favorite testimonies. Imagine this testimony. A Christian couple raises Christian kids, and they actually believe. That's a cool witness. That also could be a, a testimony. You just believe, because it's true. The other is probably the more common one. It's the Peter the disciple route where you believe, but then you kind of don't believe. You get it, but you only get 70% of it, and then you neglect it. And it's a roller coaster of yes and no. At one moment, you're, Jesus, you're the Lord. The next moment, Jesus is rebuking you and saying, get behind me, Satan. You're saying, I'm going to die for the faith. The next moment, you're denying Christ three times. But in the next moment, Jesus is saying, uh, do you love me three times? And you're saying yes. Regardless of the story of how you came to faith, you have a unique story. Own it, be grateful for it, and share it. Be aware of the language you may, have, you may use to discuss the testimony. But at the end of the day, all models of conversion, all systems of trying to create a recipe to become a Christian will fail because the goal is not for you to believe things. The goal for you is to get into a relationship with the living God. I could convince your mind that God is real, but that's not enough. Satan knows that God is real. But the goal is for us to trust Christ, to surrender to him, to be transformed by him, to be on his team, to serve him, to know him personally. So whatever system we could create, could sometimes fall short if it loses sight of that personal touch, that actual moment where the Holy Spirit is now with you, Jesus is Lord, and you belong to God the Father. Jesus says, when he's talking to Nicodemus on John chapter 3, the wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Sometimes it could get weird because it feels like we are controlling the Holy Spirit. You, I'm, I, I know sometimes I misspeak when I use the word Holy Spirit. It's tough for preachers because the Holy Spirit has multifacets. But at the end of the day, the Holy Spirit is God. And God could do whatever the, he wants. <laughs> like God could save you however he wants to save you. But it's through Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross where the salvation comes. But the moment I'm trying to create a religion where I'm trying to contain the Holy Spirit in a box and be like, this is it. We lose sight of the whole point. God is God. We worship him alone. We trust him. And in this new season and this new day, those unchanging truths need to be applied in a unique way. Holy Spirit may want us to do things in, a, in church in a way that has never been done before, but it's not 
unchristian. It's just different. We always have to be sensitive to let God be God and never try to box God out of his own church. Because the reality is where the Holy Spirit is, that's where the church is, the true church of Christ. Where there, there's Christians who have the Holy Spirit, they're temples of the living God, they believe in Jesus Christ, God is their father, where that community gathers, that is the true church. That is pure Christianity because God is God and we are his servants. So conversion stories are unique. We don't want to create systems where we box out the Holy Spirit. And we want to be to acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ alone who saves us. John baptized with water. Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And I am in the belief when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit, you're baptized by the Spirit. Now we're going to talk about how different traditions interpret, interpret that phrase. But this is where I am coming from. So regardless of how you interpret the, the, the phrase baptism in the spirit, uh, every Christian needs to point to the source of salvation. The way we get connected to God is the one Jesus Christ. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandal I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. I want that. That's pretty cool. And Jesus does that. When you accept him, you have the gift of the Spirit. When you have the Spirit, you're saved. Because the Holy Spirit helps you see Jesus for who he is. It's not natural to believe that someone who lived, died, and is alive right now, it, if, if you rationally believe that, you're not thinking rationally. You need the Holy Spirit to help you see Jesus Christ as the living Lord. You need the Holy Spirit to be changed from the inward out. You need God, the Holy Spirit, to actually believe in Jesus. Without the Spirit, you could be creating your own religion. But with the Holy Spirit and uh, knowing the scriptures, it actually leads to a great Christian flourishing. Our job is to point to Jesus Christ. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Look, Jesus, he died for you. He loves you. He forgives you. Look, it's Jesus. He's the one who could baptize you with the Spirit. I can't do that. Look, it's Jesus Christ who forgives sins. Before the foundations of the world, he lives. Look, it's Jesus, the fulfillment of God's plans for us. Look, it's Jesus, our friend, our Savior, our Lord. Look, it's Jesus who loves us. As a church, we need to be open to the Spirit and point people to Christ because he's the source of it all. Now let's go to the scripture we read together. You had 12 disciples in Ephesus. They were good people. They were righteous Jews, most likely, all 12 of them. And sometimes we, we can fall into this trap of thinking that, all right, if someone is not a Christian, they're a bad guy, not a good person. I don't think that's true. You probably know some good people who could be uh, agnostic or atheistic. But the goal is not to turn bad people to good people. The goal of our, of our message is to turn dead people into alive people, to have people who are destined to be away from God, to be connected to God, to have people fully alive by embracing their savior, Jesus, and receiving the spirit. That's what we're about. So these are good people. They did a baptism of repentance. Some people would not want to say that this is their first baptism and they needed a second baptism when Paul came around. I don't think that's the case. I think they needed to become Christ followers first and foremost. So they get to a point where they meet Paul and Paul is worried about them because they have no understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. And of course, they're not going to have any understanding of who the Holy Spirit is because they don't know Jesus Christ yet. They had to be baptized in the name of Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, when they believed and were baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, I mean, uh, they, were, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they were filled with the Spirit and a sign of that was prophecy and speaking in tongues. 
Certain traditions interpret that, this is a classical Pentecostal tradition, that a true sign of your conversion is you have to speak in tongues. That's not what the rest of scripture testifies to. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit on Bible study. We're pro-gifts of the Holy Spirit, but it's just one sign of being baptized in the Spirit. And I say all this because during my conversion, I didn't start prophesying or speaking in tongues, but I had the Holy Spirit. It, it could be dangerous when we add things to Scripture that are not mentioned, or they happen in a couple of stories, but they don't happen in every story. If you look through Acts, there are many moments where people become Christian and they start speaking in tongues. But not every instant of someone becoming a Christian, someone starts speaking in tongues. And I say this because I know many people who are coming from the Pentecostal tradition who are burned out by it. And I've been in a couple of prayer meetings where the person is a spirit-filled Christian, but they don't have the gift of speaking in tongues and they're viewed as less than because they don't do it. Or if they do do it, they're making it up. Just to be clear, we're open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is one of them. And it can be a sign that you have the Holy Spirit because your spirit is using you to speak in tongues. However, going back to creating systems, this is one thing the classic Pentecostal church did, which I think uh, did a negative because it has people feeling like second-class Christians if they don't have that gift. And I'm talking about this because we want to be a church that's open to the Holy Spirit, but also biblically anchored. We want to embrace the different gift things of the Holy Spirit, but make sure that we realize that all of us might have different giftings. And I get all this from the scriptures. I'm trying to interpret the scriptures as properly as I can. So these group of people, they became Christians, and in that moment of conversion, they also received the giftings of prophecy and speaking in tongues. I feel like wanting to take questions, but anyway. So moral of the story is, um, another case study. This is my call story. That's me at this camp when I finished my freshman year of college. Look at me, beardless hike with, with uh, yeah, I look kind of, look, yeah, it's really, uh, I'm glad I'm not wearing socks in that picture. Sometimes I wear socks and sandals, a big no-no. Um, <laughs> So I am that years old when the Lord tells me to go start preaching to people. It was during a worship service, music is playing, and then I hear the Lord say, preach, preach, preach. And I'm kind of aware of the Lord's voice, but not that clearly ever. And then my friend Chris Armstrong, this big Irish guy from the uh, central PA comes up to me and goes, whatever God is telling you right now, go do it. And then a chaplain at MIT, who I still don't know his name. I could probably figure out who he is, but I don't know who he was. He was the chaplain at MIT at this conference. He comes up to me and says the same thing. He says, what's going on? I see the Holy Spirit on you. I'm like, that's weird language. But okay, well, uh, this is what's happening. Uh, I'm hearing the phrase, preach, preach, preach. And then, you know what he told me? Start preaching. Oh, that's how this works. God speaks, you obey. And then he gave me some better information afterwards. He said, pick up your Bible, know it well. Preach from your Bible. If people respond positively, keep doing it. If not, you may want to reconsider this whole situation. That's why I'm here right now. It's because of that moment. I've been preaching and teaching whoever welcomes me, and I'm just doing it out of obedience, but I also do it because I love to do it, because God made me to do this. And I mention all this because it was in that moment where I got the gift of speaking in tongues. I wasn't looking for it. I actually had a theology that was against it. And that theology of being against it came because my dad went to a, a Pentecostal church next to our house growing up. And he went to a worship service. And during that worship service, he heard someone speaking in a language that he understood in the natural. He understands five different languages one of them being Turkish. A guy is speaking in tongues and he's cursing him out in Turkish. The language that committed genocide on my people and he's cursing him out of church service. Just because someone is speaking in tongues doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit. So I hear this story. 
my dad's saying, be careful of that wacky Pentecostal stuff. So I'm careful of this stuff. I'm cautious. But then the Lord sometimes will give you something you're not asking for. It was after the fact that the Holy Spirit uh, became really alive and present. Uh, I would feel a fiery sensation in my throat. And that was a sign for me to open my lips. And I started praying in a language that I didn't understand at the time. That was different. That was weird. But I opened to the scriptures and I see that it's a gift, one of the many gifts uh, that's mentioned in the Holy Spirit, uh, in, 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 in the gifts of the Spirit. But that wasn't the moment I became a Christian and received the Holy Spirit for the first time. That happened a few years earlier. The moral of the story is when the language of baptizing the Holy Spirit is used, I believe it's just saying you became a Christian. That's it. And then the Lord will fill you, give you gifts, give you callings, pivot your directions in different seasons, give you the power, give you the ability to do what needs to be done for his purpose because every gift he gives is meant to be given to someone else. Every call that he's placed on you is meant to serve him and other people. Everything that the Lord wants from you is to show love and to point people to the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ. The call story. What are you called to? What were some of your moments post-conversion that the Lord has placed on you? Dreams that he's given you. Do you need a word right now? For me to tell you, just do it. <laughs> just obey him. Trust him. He'll give you the giftings. He'll give you his presence. He'll give you what you need. But just obey. And walk in step with the spirit day by day. So filling of the Spirit is something that happens throughout your life. If you look at the narrative of the book of Acts, that phrase is used time and time again. The apostles were filled with the Spirit. Peter and John were filled with the Spirit. And usually they're filled with the Spirit in moments where they need to step up and be bold for the Christian faith. They were filled with the Spirit, but they already were converted. They already had a relationship with God and the, and, and the, and the Holy Spirit and the Father. But there's going to be moments in our Christian walk where the end all be all is not just to get to heaven one day by salvation. That's the first step of a bigger journey. And to be a disciple, that first step is crucial. Don't get me wrong. We want to evangelize. We want to tell people the only way to God is through Jesus. Repent and believe in him. Receive the spirit. Have his dad become your dad. We want that. But I'm talking about for the mature Christian who already experienced that and has, in, has lived that out. There'll be moments where you'll be filled with his presence to do things that uh, God wants you to do for him in those moments. And that's, that's what we want to do every week. We want to seek God's face. We want to be filled with his presence so we could go out this week and be lights in dark places, that we could be the salt of the earth. We need to spiritually seek God together as a community so that we could be bold witnesses and point people, look, here's the son of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Pentecost uh, movement started 2,000 years ago. The church starts. The Holy Spirit descends. They already had the words to talk about Jesus. The gospel already happened. But Jesus says, wait, wait for my spirit. I'm going to clothe you with my presence. After you receive the Holy Spirit, then go and proclaim the gospel. Because you can't properly proclaim the gospel without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends. The church begins. And what does Peter do right away? He opens up the Bible and explains the prophecy that is fulfilled in the Old Testament in that moment. The beginning of the church is when this power of the Spirit is there and the words of Scripture are there to help explain what's happening. And many people converted and were baptized that day. So CFTN, we want to be a place where in certain circles it's called a spirit and word church. We're open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're open to whatever God wants to do. So we're not just some cookie cutter church because God wants us to be a unique piece of his body here at CFTN. 
But we also don't want to deviate from scriptures. We honor the word of God and we're open to the things of the spirit. Make sense? Amen? Everyone? Amen. Yeah. Praise God for that. So what happens when you deviate from scripture? Then you get the negative stereotypes of the Pentecostal giftings and, 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 and that movement. You get weird prosperity gospels. You get theologies where you say you have to speak in tongues to be a Christian. You have a theology where it's, if you're not being healed, that means uh, something's wrong with you. We, I believe in healing. I have many stories where God could heal, but there's also the cross and the reality that death is there. Without the scriptures, it could get weird. However, without the Holy Spirit, it also gets very weird. It gets legalistic. There's far right fundamentalistic versions of this, where it's the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. And there's no room for the Holy Spirit all of a sudden. And they have a theology where the Holy Spirit just disappeared after the first century, like God is not the same yet today, yesterday, and forever. Just because you may have not experienced something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You also have liberal versions of this. I went to a very progressive seminary. They just were like the Sadducees. They, they cut out parts of the scripture that were supernatural because it doesn't go with their reason. That is also problematic. Both sides actually do the same thing, though. The super progressive Christian and the far right Christian, you know what they have in common? There's no room for the Holy Spirit. They box the Holy Spirit out for different reasons. The Holy Spirit is our guide to help us actually understand the scriptures. The Holy Spirit will actually speak to you when you're evangelizing and recall certain passages you need to speak in that moment. The Holy Spirit will comfort and guide you in the midst of suffering. The Holy Spirit is that peace that surpasses all understanding. The Holy Spirit gives you the character of Christ to be full of joy, love, patience, peace. The Holy Spirit also gives us giftings to serve other people with. When the scriptures and the openness to the scriptures when there's an openness to the spirit and there's an openness to the being obedient to the scriptures, the church is at work. The church is at work. Same church that started when the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost, Peter opened up the scriptures. We too want a, a fresh outpouring of the spirit. We open up the scriptures, help us understand what's happening, God. Help us not deviate from these scriptures or these teachings. But help us be obedient. Help us be empowered. Help us be bold. Help us do what we need to do with your help. So where does the spirit side get it wrong? We talked about this already. There is a phrase in the, in the classic Pentecostal world of a second blessing. There's only one baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the moment of conversion. Not a second baptism later. Uh, we talked about this. There, there, there could be added things to the scriptural narrative that are not there. Uh, there is the sin of the Pharisees here when it comes to scriptural interpretation. Adding parts to the scripture that are not there. The Bible never says everyone needs to speak in tongues. In fact, it says the opposite in 1 Corinthians. It says, does everyone speak in tongues? Indicating that no, that's not the case. There is this tendency for churches, whether they're Pentecostal, Calvinistic, uh, high church, low church, no church, uh, to add things in the Bible that are not there. We want to make sure that we're all in for the scriptures and not speak where the scriptures don't speak. The, the, a, a classic example of this is the Bible says you can't dance or drink. No, it doesn't. It does not say that. If you don't want to dance, that's cool. If you don't want to drink, that's cool. But the Bible does not say that. Don't say that the Bible says that. Simple addition to the scriptures. I'm not trying to yell at you. I'm just getting passionate. <laughs> okay. Where does the word side get it wrong? They subtract things from scriptures. And in this topic, there's this theology called cessationism. And they wrongly interpret 1 Corinthians 13 to indicate that the Holy Spirit was only around for a certain dispensation in the first century. And all I have to say to those people is just travel. Meet some Christians outside of your little bubble. It's exciting. Do some missionary work. You'll see the Holy Spirit at work. 
but this is a theology where people subtract things from the Bible. It's a Thomas Jefferson Bible. Thomas Jefferson, the president of the United States, he had a Bible where he cut out every miracle of Jesus Christ. Anything supernatural, like the Sadducees did. They didn't believe in angels and demons. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. There is this tendency, unlike the, the, the spirit side, to do the subtracting side. And you just cut out the Bible parts that are something you may not have experienced before. But the scriptures are there for a reason. They're, help to, to, they're helping us live out the Christian walk. So cessationism is this belief where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer functioning today. And oftentimes they're reacting to the craziness of the Pentecostal world. And there's a lot of craziness there. Don't get me wrong. We want to rebuke that too. But we don't want to throw the bath with the, the, the water out with the bath water. What's the phrase? Bath water? The baby out with the bath water. You overreact because you've had that negative experience. Therefore, it's all false. No. My, my dad had that really bad experience because someone was not speaking in the Holy Spirit. Some other spirit was speaking. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wouldn't do that. But it doesn't mean that that gift is not right or true. Uh, so cessationism is this belief where there's no more operations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it kind of just whitewashes the, 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 the gifts listed in Romans and 1 Corinthians. Um, and I'm saying this as someone coming out of that side. So if you strongly disagree, you may have had experienced a negative expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You may have belonged to some weird Pentecostal cult, or you, uh, you were just uh, manipulated and it was all emotion and nothing spiritual. That could have happened. And I'm sorry for you. Or you just never experienced anything that the Bible says you could experience. That's a separate argument or story to talk about. So whatever it is, the moral of the story is, I would love to talk if you have questions. I kept saying moral of the story multiple times of the story. Anyway, <laughs> also a place where we could talk about this topic, being a spirit and word church, how we could operate healthily in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is on March 7th, 15th and 21st, we're gonna do an intensive course on the, the, this, the spiritual gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians. So if you have questions about speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, gifts of healings, uh, signs and wonders, prophecy, words of knowledge, we will talk about them in a biblically sound way. We're gonna go through Old Testament examples, New Testament examples, current day examples of these gifts operating. And what I find when I teach on this material Christians who've been saved for a long time, who have the Holy Spirit, or finally understand how God wants them to be used. Like, oh, that thing is discernment this whole time? Oh, th that's word of knowledge this whole time? <laughs> oh, when I feel led to pray for someone and something positive happens, that's the gift of the Spirit this whole time? That happens, that tends to happen a lot when I talk about this material. So if you would like to come, you have a, three weeks to block out your calendars, and we could have healthy, productive, word and spirit conversations to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit um, and give us the gift things that we need to grow God's church. An important thing to also mention, uh, sometimes churches focus too much on the gifts of the Holy Spirit without the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They need to go hand in hand. You need the character and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we want to be a place where we don't grieve the character of the Holy Spirit through our sin and disobedience but we also don't want to be a church that quenches and detests anything like prophecy. Uh, we don't want to quench or grieve God the Holy Spirit. So I want to conclude this sermon with talking about uh, a vision in Revelation. What is our power to overcome the evil one? Then this is coming from Revelation. Now have come the salvation and the power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters, that's Satan, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. How do we triumph over the evil one? They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down. For to you, he's filled with fury. Um, Anyway, there's one more verse that says his days are numbered. But our purpose right now is to make sure we tell the story of when we were baptized by the Spirit. When did God become real? 
When did the Holy Spirit become not some sort of thing that, that we just mysteriously talk about, but it's the, per, the person who dwells with us? When did Jesus become more than a name for us? When was that moment or moments that led you to be a Christian? Share your testimony and proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. Point people to him. Say, look it, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and may the Holy Spirit anoint and empower your proclamation because that's the way we could welcome people to have a relationship with him. Brothers and sisters, every time we take the bread and drink the cup, we're saying, look, this is the blood of the lamb who died for you. He takes away the sins of the world. He's taken away your sins. When we walk into the light as he is in the light, we are absolved of our sins. On the night of his betrayal, after giving thanks, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body given to you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is the blood shed for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever we take and eat, whenever we take and drink, we proclaim his saving death until he returns. Now to conclude this series on the sacraments and the spirit, this is a meal for those who've been baptized in the spirit. This is a meal for Christians. The Holy Spirit welcomes us to have a meal with our Savior. So I want you to um, come to this table, reminded of your testimony, reminded of that moment where God became real, because it only was possible through the death of Jesus Christ. Through his death, resurrection, ascension, we are saved. I'd like to invite the band and those servers up. And I'd like to say a prayer as we are about to partake in communion. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the collective testimonies here in your church. I thank you, every one of us that I've talked to, have gotten to know in this past year, has a deep moment where you became real. You've saved us from awful circumstances. You delivered us from evil. And most importantly, you simply just want to live life with us. So we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We thank you for this weekly reminder of your death and resurrection, of that great love that you have for us, that while we were still sinners, you died and saved us. So we thank you, Lord, as we approach this table and simply thank you for the testimonies you have given us and thank you for baptizing us in your presence with the Spirit. Welcome to the table.